Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. I trust you had a good weekend. We had a heat wave a few weeks ago and now the rains have come and it's rather cool and chilly and of course flooded. Um, my home thoughts start with two photographs I found on the Wall Street Journal which look rather nice. The St. Regis Bahia Beach Resort where apparently they specifically focus on helping you meditate and then this, the one and only Ocean Club, and uh, that looked pretty good in the Bahamas, 125 foot infinity pool, an ocean grill serving fresh seafood and other snacks. I'd like to congratulate Mr. and Mrs. Bob Collymore uh, on their marriage. It was great fun uh, being a part of it yesterday at Bob's place. Uh, some very emotional speeches were made and really was most enjoyable. And that took me to Charles Dickens. Have a heart that never hardens, and a temper that never tires, and a touch that never hurts. A wonderful fact to reflect upon that every human creature is constituted to be that profound, secret, mystery to every other Hans Dickens again. But then I must throw in some Roberto Bolano and I'm still waiting for this book 2666 with a from Mr. Chan in the IA Centre. Only in chaos are we conceivable. Years ago I used to think it was possible for a novelist to alter the inner life of the culture. This is in Mao too. I've said it before, I like this Don DeLillo. Now bomb makers and gunmen have taken that territory. They make raids on human consciousness. Powerful events build their own networks of chaos and ambiguity, Delina wrote in a 2004 essay on Oswald. The mass of facts that accumulated on these events has its own interconnections, missing pieces, buried meanings. The Sinaev story is a grand banquet for conspiracy theorists involving the FBI, the Russians, terror cells in Dagestan and Chechnya, the unsolved murder of Tamerlane's best friend and two others in 2011. Within hours of the bombing you could find pictures online that claim to show government agents standing near the site of the first bomb right before it went off. Tamerlane himself frequented conspiracy websites. Did he anticipate the endless conspiracy theorizing that his bombing would give rise to? Conspiracy thinking is similar in a way to a terror plot to both lend structure to ambiguous reality. The more demonstrably false the theory, the more powerful it serves as a protest against reality. Well, a lot of these events do tend to originate out of intelligence. I tend to find political reflections. Last Thursday, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry met with Azerbaijan's dictator Ilham Aliyev in Washington and called for an ultimate resolution of the decades-old conflict in the disputed province of Nagorno-Karabakh. On Friday, as the hereditary Azeri despot was on the plane back to Baku, Azeri troops were already launching an offensive against the breakaway Republic of Nagorno Karabakh. One of the first casualties was a 12 year old Armenian boy. And uh, I think uh, you can probably surmise that Turkey has had, has had a hand in this as well in order to put pressure on Russia. The Panama Papers, what you need to know, um, I haven't been able to go through the documents, but I will um, over the next few days. What is Mossack Fonseca? It is a Panama-based law firm of services, including corporate companies in offshore jurisdictions such as the British Virgin Islands. It ministers offshore firms for a yearly fee. Other services include wealth management. Where is it based? It is based in Panama, but runs a worldwide operation. 600 people, 42 countries. How big is it? Fourth biggest provider of offshore services is active for more than 300,000 companies. 
how much data has been leaked a lot. The leak is one of the biggest ever, larger than the US diplomatic cables released by WikiLeaks in 2010, and the secret intelligence documents given to journalists by Edward Snowden in 2013. There are 11.5 million documents and 2.6 terabytes of information drawn from Mossack Fonseca's internal database. A photograph of Panama, where Mossack uh, Fonseca is based. Ramon Fonseca is an award-winning novelist, apparently. North Korea, so, so it's going to be a big thing. Um, I'll have to get into it once again and see what it's all about and who's implicated. WikiLeaks are pretty dynamic, aren't they, getting this kind of information out there. North Korea says, under Leningrad-style siege from the US, North Korea's top military body has accused US-led hostile forces of laying siege to the country, like Leningrad in World War II and Cuba during the Cold War missile crisis. In a statement carried Monday by the North's official KCNA news agency, the spokesman for the National Defense Commission, NDC, also said the latest UN sanctions imposed on Pyongyang over its nuclear weapons program were anachronistic and suicidal. It could trigger a nuclear strike on the US mainland. The UN, Sec UN Security Council adopted its toughest economic sanctions to date on North Korea. NDC spokesman said the sanctions would work of the US and other hostile forces who were intent on attacking North Korea in a flock to swallow it up. The Leningrad blockade, which struck terror into the hearts of the people and the Caribbean crisis in the Cold War era, can hardly stand in comparison with the situation. I concluded by saying the arrival of the THAAD has made China fall in line and undercut North Korea. So what is the United States' next move? Is there any way to halt China's seemingly unstoppable advance towards during the South China Sea into late Beijing? As if things could not get any worse in the South China Sea, China's placement and testing of anti-ship missiles in the South China Sea all but confirms Asia's worst fears. America's goal to ensure that China's rise is peaceful that Beijing would take its place among nations of the Asia-Pacific and larger Indo-Pacific as a responsible stakeholder is dead and buried, according to this article. But the point is that the U.S. is going to have to put up because the Chinese are making incremental gains and sometimes not so incremental at all. Al-Shabaab leader Hassan Ali Dore was killed in a U.S. drone strike in Somalia. One wonders if it's really a factory line as folks keep being produced on folks who shoot one and other one comes. Euro 113.91, dollar index 94.64, Japanese yen 111.43, Swissy 0.9587, the pound 142.12, the Aussie 0.7632, India rupee 66.335, South Korean 111.4874, Real 355, 336, that's strong Egyptian pound, 8.886, and the rand 14.73, just sell the rand, just sell it. Um, we'll put the stops on the like 14.25 dollar index, I'll put up a one year chart, we're at 94.60, uh, sorry, yes, 94.60, key support is around the 93 level, we might go and test it, but I think if we do that, then the dollar is a big buy. Euro dollar 113.92, edging towards the key resistance area of 114.50. Um, if we hurdle that, I mean, we'd be going back up to 120. Sterling fears mount as Britain nears vote on EU Brexit. Have a look at this. This is a volatility chart from Holger. Former Soros partner Jim Rogers is short the fans, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix. Google, apparently. Gold, let me put up a one-year chart. We keep coming back on this 12.50 level. We're back at 12.17. Feeling tired. 12.50 is a bit far away now with the key pivot. Crude oil, put up a one-year chart. Um, I think we're now going back to below 30. 
The world's richest banker has been charged with corruption. This is Joseph Safra, 77-year-old owner of the Safra Group, latest member of the elite in Brazil to be embroiled in a corruption scandal. The financier owns London's Gherkin Tower. It's worth an estimated $18.3 billion, according to Fortune. Of course, uh, I can't remember whether it was his brother or his uncle, but it was a strange case of Edwin Safra. He was murdered, um, and it's still not clear who murdered him. Uh, there's a link to an article in The Guardian that starts here. Each night in Monte Carlo, it is said, a record of predatory birds is transmitted through hidden light loudspeakers in the main square to prevent sparrows from soiling the famous casino's pristine. Like this photograph of the coastline on Lanyu Island in southeast China's Taiwan, Sub-Saharan Africa, how an underground hip-hop artist and his book club threatens Angola's regime. This is the 17 Angolan activists who received sentences ranging from two to eight and a half years in jail for participating in a book club that was discussing Gene Sharp's from dictatorship to democracy. Far from being an isolated act of dissent, their book club was actually an escalation of a decade-plus conflict between Africa's second longest serving president, Jose Eduardo dos Santos, and young younger seeking a brighter, more democratic future. The conflict was sparked, and I didn't know this, on November 26, 2003, when a car wash in the capital city of Luanda was caught singing a politically defiant tune by popular Angolan rapper MCK. Presidential Guard soldiers seized the young man, Arsenio Sebastião. Against the cries of onlookers, they tied his arms behind his back and marched him out to the Atlantic Ocean. While the Presidential Guard soldiers had intended to cultivate a climate of fear in the Luanda population. They may have done quite the opposite. The drowned Sebastio's martyrdom continues to fuel the flames of a growing citizens' movement in his homeland. Put up a photograph of the Angolan rapper Luati Barao, also known as Iconoclasca. And uh, I've spoken about it separately, but things are pretty fragile. World Economic Forum, which is Africa's new top investment destination. Ivory Coast is one, Kenya is two. Britain under pressure to review £200 million aid for Tanzania after US cut support. They've lost a lot of aid of late. Perno's CEO's late foray into Africa takes him to Soweto Tavern. Alexandre Ricard's smile didn't waver as he entered a tavern in the South African township of Soweto and saw one of Pernod Ricard's most popular whiskies shelved behind steel grates capped with iron shards. The CEO took a picture of the security precautions and the meager layout on his iPhone, thanked the woman behind the bar for her welcome and stepped out into the unpaved street. We have to be here, said Ricard 43, during a visit last month to the slum to see two of the more than 2,000 makeshift taverns called Shemines that Perno sells to. The world's second largest distiller is targeting Africa as the next big market for its Jameson Irish whiskey and absolute vodka more than 50 years after what is now competitive Diageo PLC began producing there. Continental spending on consumer goods is projected to hit $1.4 trillion by 2020, according to McKinsey. Africa has the potential to become as important as Asia, currently Puerto Rico's largest region for revenue in the company. So timing isn't optimal. Consumer confidence is eroding in South Africa. Um, uh, oil price uh, hitting Angola and Nigeria. Pana opened both open subsidiaries in both countries that year. 
It would have been better to invest earlier as the environment in Africa is very mixed at the moment, says Victor Lopez, Africa economist at Standard Chart. The oil price crash has hurt such countries as Angola, while others like Ivory Coast and Ethiopia are doing very well. Perno and Ricard also faces a tough opponent in Diageo. They are the maker of Johnny Walker Scotch and Smyrna Vodka. Diageo already sells to over 20,000 shabines in South Africa alone and dominates sales of spirits on the wider continent. Its market share for spirits by volume in Africa. Plus, the Middle East is 23% versus Perno and Ricard is 5 if Pano wants to take over the edge globally, they need to close a gap in Africa. So they're in for a long war. Um, Diageo CEO signaled the slowdown in Africa to investors in January. Uh, it's a tough part of the curve at the moment. John O'Keefe, president of Diageo's Africa division. We've been in Africa a long, long time and we've learned what it takes to operate through the economic cycle. Very interesting piece worth reading. The link is on Rich Grandpup's KPMG has cut its ties with Zuma linked Guptas mid influence probes. Trevor Hu, who's the South African CEO, said association risk is too great. Um, the Gupta family's Oak Bay investments as our very clear understanding is that this was a very reluctant decision on their behalf. South African President Jacob Zuma should resign, writes the New York Times editorial board. It took me back to the 14th of December when I said the markets are not interested in President Zuma's explanations. They are seeing a South African president who has gone rogue. Um, going back to that editorial, it's talking about the ruling of the Constitutional Court, which said that in refusing to pay back the millions spent on it. Uh, Mr. Zuma has failed to uphold, defend, and respect the Constitution as the supreme law of the land. That has been the story of Mr. Zuma's leadership. The President of South Africa is elected by Parliament, dominated by the ANC, so withdrawal of support by the ANC National Executive Committee would be tantamount to a demand that Mr. Zuma resign at its time. South African all share is up 1.76% this year. Dollar Rand, I think you sell it now, 14.73. I've timestamped to my recommendation. Egypt's exchange bureaus investigated for hoarding dollars. 15 exchange bureaus after the central bank reported them for hoarding dollars. Black market rate is above 10, which is the lowest ever. I think. Egyptian stock market up 7.35% this year. Nigerian all share down 10.95% so far this year. Ghana stock has changed the positive index down 4.28% this year. Great article in the FT by Katrina Manson, who used to be here, and his good friend jostling for Djibouti. The world's superpowers are competing for global influence in this tiny, impoverished country in the Horn of Africa. 30% of all shipping world passes this point on the northeast edge of Africa where the water narrows to a few kilometers opposite Yemen, a former French colony that became independent only in 1977. Djibouti sits at the southern entrance to the Red Sea en route to the Suez Canal, a waypoint between Africa, India and the Middle East. Over the past 15 years the country has set about capitalizing on its location at the nexus of international trade. Once completed, the Doralay multipurpose port will be the largest of eight ports that together will handle containers, livestock, oil, phosphates and more. The geostrategic ambition of the small authoritarian state does not stop there. The US, several European countries and Japan have all pinned global military ambitions on Djibouti. Now China is set to do the same. China is planning its first overseas military base at Dorale. Um, one US soldier who served here describes it as a hot hell box in the armpit of Africa. Temperatures reach in the mid 40s. People like to chew captive bitter leaves, so renowned for its amphetamine, amphetamine like properties that it has banned in Britain and the US. If Djiboutians stopped chewing cat, 
for seven days that would overthrow the government, says one poor worker. Djibouti is now the active centre for what US soldiers in the camp referred to as GWOT, the Global War on Terror. Nightlife for the parts of the city and many Muslims are dry. Drinking is common. Everyone here drinks, and if they don't, they drink in private. One Djibouti in gyms. Interesting photographs from Alexis Okeoo, the forgotten mountains of Darfur, are talking about what's happening there. Kenya, Africa watches as Kenya prepares to test Eurobot waters back in January. Investors were demanding record premiums of 620 basis points to hold African bonds rather than US debt. That has now fallen back to 550, with oil importers Kenya and Ivory Coast topping the list of winners. Now some countries could leverage the improved mood. Kenya's presentation led by Finance Minister Henry Rowe Titch is billed as a non-deal roadshow, but it's likely to be at least testable waters. Kenya could probably issue, aside from the 8% budget deficit, it's a pretty good story. Currency is stable, domestic rates are coming down, inflation is starting to fall, and growth is in the 5 to 6% range. The yield on Kenya's existing 2024 dollar bond is down to around 7.75%, down from 9.8% hit in January. So it's a good sign, and as I said, it was a massive buy about 9%. UK government now turns its guns on Moy era looters, offered to help Kenya trace and recover assets looted by Moy era power men named in the Pro report. Even as the risk consulting firm says it has only completed a quarter of the job. The key triangulator uh, is turning out to be overseas. Kenyans gulped a total of 12.7 million litres of spirits in 20 thanks to increased uptake by the low-income and lower-middle-income consumers in new study shows. 12% growth came as patrons increasingly turned to spirits such as brandy, gin and vodka due to their affordability and availability in smaller packs. This makes spirits one of Kenya's fastest-growing alcoholic beverages category compared to beer, whiskey and wines. The growing young population in Kenya will also provide an opportunity for strong growth, said the London-based intelligence firm. The Nairobi National Park is home to about 35 lions, and about 2,000 lions are left in all of Kenya. So it's terrible what's happened. The Mohawk and then to another lioness that got speared. Ken Shilling, 101.57. Nairobi all share plus 1.19% year to date. Um, and my piece of the weekend is called the bifurcation of the Nairobi Stock Exchange. According to the dictionary, bifurcate means to divide into two parts or branches or forked into two parts as the Y-shaped style of seven flowers. What is clear is that the Nairobi Security Exchange is bifurcated and this trend has accelerated during the recent earnings announcement season. Nairobi all shares up 1.19% this year at a 17-week high. The NSE 20 is down 1.09% at its 11-week high. However, these benign year-to-date returns are veiling a big bifurcation. Winners are winning big and the losers are losing their shirts. Bloomberg carried a report last week which was headlined in the new emerging markets, Alpha comes in the form of politics. Situations like that require being more on the ground to be there to understand what's happening. The result is a dramatic shift. Firms now have analysts, learn the names of politicians, prosecutors, Supreme Court justices, double the number of trips, scan prices in foreign supermarkets, track footprints in stores, and read facial expressions of policymakers. Global fragility, they say, is unveiling institutional weakness graft, poor governance, and low labour productivity, and they need to track them all. Now back to the bourse, and let's sift through the winners and losers, starting with the big winners, the outliers. Standard Chartered has soared 26.66% this year. That's 22 times better than the benchmark index. Co-op up 16.66%, DTB up 14.43%, Kennel Cobal up 18.22%, Baburi Cement 
10.85%, BAT 8.15%, Safari come out just 3.36% here today, but I'm expecting it to deliver a plus 37.61% return before the end of the year. That's just from the price, 22.50. KCB, I have a 37.14% price appreciation target to 60. If you are clustered in these stocks, then you have alpha this year. On the flip side, We've seen some dramatic slumps. Let's start with National Bank, which was planted in the headlines last week. It is down 23.59% in 2016. And worryingly, on Friday, there was not one single buyer showing and closing the bank. NBK is trading at 13 year lows. Barclays Bank Kenya is down 19.485%. And slumped an 11 2011 low Friday. High frequency social media commentary. Do a lot of analysis around that. Bloomberg even have somebody allocated to that. Is signaling a franchise under pressure and stress. Uchumi has declined 53.42%. Transcentury has slumped 40.571%. An all-time low. I have to admit, I missed some big clues. I remember being face to face with an erstwhile grocer, and uh, when the share price was riding high at 21 facial expression just would not synchronize with what I was hearing. And I give a shout out to Sunil Sanger, who spotted the NBK fiasco in the middle of last year. Nairobi NSC20 down 1.09%, Standard Chartered put up a graph up 26.66%, by contrast, Barclays Kenya down 19.485%, National Bank at a 2005 low, minus 25.39%. If you want to look into any listed share, just click on the link which is right at the bottom of Rich Wrap-Ups. Remember, if you want to follow the stock market in real time, you can for free. Go to rich.co.ke, get a password, register, it's free, and then go to Rich Live. Any problems with registration, get hold of us via Twitter or email. Once again, wish you a great week.